Thank you. You got my name right. You got my bio right. Everything's great. So I, I have been in many speeches where I had to sit in the front like you guys. I'm going to offer you a serious favor. So one of the hardest things when you're sitting in the front and the audience is watching you the whole time and you have to listen to a speaker is you have to appear attentive <laughs> for like 45 minutes. So I'm giving you the option now of sitting in the audience so you're not on stage. I'm going to take you up. See? You see? This is a lesson here. Know your customer. There. Now you don't have to act like you agree with me. You don't have to act like you're interested in my speech. It takes a lot of pressure off. OK, so there you go. So let me tell you about myself. You heard my bio. Uh, fundamentally, I sort of made my reputation at Apple. I was Apple's software evangelist. This is in 1983. It's before you were born. And my role in that division was to convince people to write Macintosh software and Macintosh, create Macintosh hardware. Uh, that division, of course, worked for Steve Jobs. It was probably the largest collection of egomaniacs in the history of California. Uh, that's saying a lot, because there are a lot of egomaniacs in California. We held that record for a good 30 years. Uh, Facebook recently broke it. But we held the record for the most egomaniacs in California. Uh, I have been a chief evangelist, an evangelist for Apple. I have started several software companies. I've been a venture capitalist. And now I define myself as this chief evangelist of Canva. And I hear a lot of people, how many of you use Canva already? Hi, oh, you warm my heart. Uh, so I'm chief evangelist of Canva, Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador, which means I get paid to drive a Mercedes. That's a thankful, thankless job. Somebody has to do it. And uh, finally, I'm on the uh, executive staff of the Haas School of Business of UC Berkeley. Uh, today, I'm really here to talk to you about entrepreneurship. And I've written a book called The Art of the Start. I, as I said, I've started several software companies. And so I want to give you what I consider, is it up there? Yeah, the top 10 mistakes of entrepreneurs. Maybe we can dim the lights so it'd be easier for people to see. Um, now, whenever, while you're doing that, um, Jason, you know, whenever people find out that I work for Apple and Steve Jobs, they always want a Steve Jobs story. So I'm going to fulfill my moral obligation by giving you my Steve Jobs story. So one day, I'm in my cubicle, and I'm working, and Steve Jobs shows up with somebody I've never met before in my life. And he says, Guy, what do you think of this company called Nowhere, K-N-O-W-A-R-E? It was an educational software company. And so I said, Steve, the company is mediocre. The products are mediocre. The products don't take advantage of the Macintosh graphical user interface. Very simplistic drill and practice. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Arithmetic. It's not strategic for uh, Macintosh. The company is not strategic for Apple. And the next thing he said was, I want to introduce you to the CEO of Nowhere. <laughs> so that's what it was like working for Steve. Uh, it was, <laughs> you, you had to prove yourself basically every day, every day. And, you know, I look back on my life and the, the people who have taught me the most, the teachers and the bosses, were not the easiest ones. They were the hardest ones. And so I learned the most from Steve Jobs. And I had an English teacher at Iolani School called, uh, named Harold Keebles, and he was the hardest teacher that I had. So I hope that you as young people, when you look back, and it may take 20 years, you may say to yourself that, wow, this teacher at BYUH was so hard, and I just hated him or hated her when I was in school. But now when I look back, I learned the most from that person, because that's what happened to me, OK? So I have seen uh, high-tech speakers for about 30 years. And I will tell you that there are two salient descriptors of high-tech speakers. First, they almost all suck. And second, they almost all go long. And that is a deadly combination. If you suck and you're short, it's OK. And if you're great and you're long, it's OK. But if you suck and go long, that's like being stupid and arrogant. It's just a deadly combination. <laughs> And so what I've done is I've embraced the top 10 format for all my speeches. That way, in case you think I suck, you know about how much longer I'll suck. I have 10 key points for you. 
So these are the top 10 mistakes of entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm going to tell you the mistake and then how to fix or prevent the mistake. And I guess one of the, the outcomes I would like of this speech is that at least you will make different mistakes. You will make mistakes, but I want you to make different ones from the 10 that I'm gonna tell you about, okay? Because I swear if you do that, you'll be miles ahead of most entrepreneurs. And as you, depending on your stage of your company, you may be operating a company, so you may be in the middle of making the mistake, you may be pitching a company, so in your pitch, you can avoid these mistakes to make you a more attractive investors to people like Shanoa and all the other investors you meet. So I'm gonna, this is as practical and tactical as I can make it, okay? So, uh, number one is that I think many entrepreneurs, they tend to focus on the pitch. Of course, it's a little ironic, me saying that in the middle of a pitch contest, but they focus on the pitch and they lose sight of the fact that the purpose of a company is not to raise money, it's not to have a great PowerPoint, Excel, or Word document. The purpose of a company is to make customers. And the way you make customers is by creating a product or service not by having great pitches and plans and forecasts. So you should focus, instead of on the pitch, on the prototype. Everything is about the prototype. If you make a good enough prototype, you may never have to pitch your company. Focus on the prototype, because the prototype is the actual form it's the reality of your product or service, and that's what creates customers, your product or your service. Focus on the prototype. The second thing that I see is that many, many entrepreneurs, they take a big number and multiply it by 1% to get a big number that proves the viability of their company. So if we go back in history a few years, uh, imagine the pitch for Pets.com. So Pets.com was a company that sold dog food online, basically. And so let's pretend that we're back then in the days of the dot-com, and I'll give you the pitch that we heard in Silicon Valley. This is how it goes. There are 300 million Americans. One in four owns a dog. 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. It's 150 million cans of dog food per day consumed in America. And dogs eat every day of the year. We're talking not the B2B, where the business takes the weekend off. We're talking B2C, or more accurately, B2D. Dogs eat every day of the year. So you take 150 million, and you multiply that by 365, and my goodness, billions of cans of dog food will be sold every year. Now, with my rock star programmer co-founder that I just met last week, <laughs> who has never finished a website or a software application in his or her life, I am confident that he or she will finish on time and it will be a world-class product. So, Conservatively speaking, how hard could it be to get 1% of 150 million cans of dog food per day? 1% of 150 million per day is 1.5 million. 1.5 million times 365 is five or 600 million cans of dog food every year, conservatively speaking, worst case. How many of you have made a pitch like that? You're all liars. <laughs> Every one of you has done something like that. So what I'm suggesting to you is that investors, Shanoa, all of us, angelers, we are so tired of a top-down analysis that starts with all the people in China, you just need 1% of them, imagine how many new kinds of diet soda we're gonna sell, or how many new kinds of routers, or phones, or pocket protectors, or whatever it is. Don't multiply these big numbers by 1% to prove that there's a viable market. Instead, you need to calculate from the bottom up. 
If you did the dog food analysis from the bottom up, you would do something like this. So let's say with your rock star programmer, you create this rock star website to sell dog food online, dead cows in cans, okay? And you figure, well, let's be conservative. We can get 200,000 unique visitors a month to come to dogfood.com. So 200,000 unique visitors, and let's just be conservative. 1% of them buy a case of dog food. So now we've gone from 200,000 to 2,000. So 2,000 people buy a case of dog food per month. A case of dog food has 10 cans. So now we have 200,000 people. 1% is 2,000 times 10. Guess what? It's 20,000 cans of dog food we can sell. And let me tell you, when the reality hits, on the one hand, you have one and a half million cans of dog food per month. On the other hand, you have 20,000. Guess which end of the spectrum you are most likely to be at? 20,000. So the cure here for this mistake is always calculate from the bottom up. How many unique visitors can you possibly get? How many realistic downloads of your app from the Apple Store can you possibly get? How many people can your telemarketing staff reach? How many people can you send an email address, uh, an email to, expect it to be opened, expect it to be read, and expect a response? And I think if you do a bottom-up analysis, you will always come out with a much more accurate forecast than a small percent of a big number. Total addressable market. Number three. Number three is the mistake that I see all the time, which is you scale too fast. And the way this works is you are so confident in your marketing and your market growth and your product or your service. So you make this calculation that conservatively speaking, we're going to sell a million and a half cans of dog food. 150,000 cans per day, whatever the number is. 150,000 cans per day. So to do that, my goodness, we need multiple distribution sites. We need West Coast, Midwest, East Coast. We need to have co-location because we never want dogfood.com to go down. We need multiple tech support departments. And you scale up so fast because you know that you're going to sell a minimum of 150,000 cans of dog food per day because that's your conservative estimate. And so you build up multiple distribution, multiple support staffs, multiple everything, and you have this enormous overhead. And guess what? Your rock star programmer isn't the rock star that you thought he or she was. You have to turn that person over. The site is not ready. The application is not ready. You're delayed by months and months. And now you have all these costs already built in and you're burning through your cash. So I suggest that instead of the fear of you're going to die because you can't scale fast enough, which is something I have never seen. I have never, have you ever, have you ever heard of a company dying because they couldn't scale too fast? I mean, once in my life, I would like to have this problem that I invested or created a company that couldn't scale fast enough. That is what we call in Silicon Valley a high quality problem. That problem never occurs. So the way you solve this is you have the philosophy that you will eat what you kill, which is to say that you will not figure out how to fill an order, sustain a certain customer base until you actually have that customer base. So you're not figuring out how you can deliver 150,000 cans of dog food per day until you have orders that reach 150,000 cans per day. Now, you might say to yourself, but what if we can't scale fast enough? What if those orders don't come in? And I would tell you that the danger of you scaling too fast is much greater than you cannot scale fast enough. And as a startup, two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage, if your product is good enough, the market will be very forgiving. You know, think of Twitter, how many times Twitter went down as it was coming up to speed. 
the fail whale was the most often the most common graphic you saw on Twitter. And if a product is good enough, people will forgive you for all that. But if you try to scale too fast and you increase your cost too much, you're going to die because you had too much overhead. So I think that the conservative thing to do, the wise thing to do is always have this assumption, you know, we're going to figure it out as we get there. Trust me, if you show up, and this is kind of a, a way of agreeing with Chenoa, you know, sales, revenue, proof trumps everything. And so what you want to do is, if you can show up and say, well, we need funding because, my goodness, orders are coming in so fast. We can't keep up with the orders for dog food. We need your capital and your expertise. That is a dream conversation. Because the company that came in at 9 and 10 and 11, they have a PowerPoint presentation that proves they can sell 150,000 cans of dog food per day. And you come in and you say, we're selling 20,000 per day and we can't keep up with it. That is the company that will get funded. Okay? So eat what you kill. Eat what you kill. Number four. Number four is the temptation to form partnerships. You have partnerships with Microsoft and Google and Apple. You have partnerships with all these large companies. And I'll tell you something. Uh, my assumption, and you know, I don't know if you agree with this, but the, the more a company uses the P word, partnership, in a presentation, the less believable it is. Because frankly, the companies and entrepreneurs who always mention partnerships it's because they cannot talk about revenue. So since they have no provable revenue, they have to talk about partnerships, which is basically blowing a lot of smoke. Partnership, I think, for many serious investors is a negative word. It means partnership, when I hear partnership, I parse that to, ah, lack of sales. Since you don't have sales, you have to disguise this fact by saying you have a partnership. So what's the fix? The fix is you focus on sales. And how do you focus on sales? Your prototype. As you heard before, sales trumps everything. I, I like to tell people that, say, this is not grammatical, but sales fixes everything. If you have sales, your investors will leave you alone. You'll be able to afford the foosball and the free lunch. You can have off-sites. You can do all that kind of stuff, but it's always about sales. Number five. Number five is the assumption that these dominant companies that we are aware of today, the Googles, the Apples, the Ciscos, you think that at the very formation of the company, at the stage that you are, 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 are in, they had this plan for worldwide domination. That Steve and Waz in 1976, they were sitting down there and they said, God, you know, we're going to make a personal computer. And then we're going to make a music device. And then we're going to make a tablet. And then we're going to make a phone. And then we're going to have online e-commerce, and then we're going to sell services in the cloud, and we're going to have a retail store operation. So they had this plot for worldwide domination. And it is simply not true that at the start of great tech companies, it's two guys in a garage, it's two gals in a garage, it's a guy and a gal in a garage, and they, all they're trying to do is make something cool or something neat, or something they want to use. So Waz and Jobs were trying to make an Apple I because Waz wanted to use an Apple I, not because they foresaw a day where Apple would be $1 trillion totally dominating their markets. So what I want you to do is, instead of focusing on domination and planning for this day where you have an operating system business, and you have an apps business, and you have a cloud business, and you have an e-commerce business, and you have a retail business, I just want you to focus on niches. We're going to make an operating system for the IBM PC. We're going to make a, a, a machine that hobbyists can afford, Apple One. We're going to do a little service for people to meet other people at their colleges, 
Facebook. And start with that niche, own that niche, and then go after other niches. To use a bowling analogy, it's not about bowling strikes. It's about hitting one pin down at a time. And you hit one pin down at a time, and years later you wake up and you look around and you say, my goodness, we've knocked down all the pins. We have achieved worldwide domination. It wasn't because of that one perfect ball. It was because you hit 10 pins down at a time. So you work on an operating system. Then you work on an app. Then you work on cloud-based. Then you work on e-commerce. Then you work on retail. And one day, you've achieved worldwide domination. But it's not because you started for worldwide domination at the start. It's hard enough to own a niche, much less dominate the world. Number six. Number six is that in your presentation, you use too many slides. Uh, I think you're familiar with my concept of the 10, 20, 30, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. Please embrace this. Uh, I, I have something called Meniere's disease, and Meniere's disease has three symptoms. It is hearing loss in this ear. So if you come up and talk to me after this and you talk on this side and I don't acknowledge you, it's not because I'm ignoring you, it's literally because I cannot hear you. So I have hearing loss on this side, I have tinnitus, which is a ringing in this ear. And the third symptom of Meniere's is sporadic attacks of vertigo. And so there are many theories about what causes Meniere's. Too much caffeine, that won't be true here. <laughs> too much salt, too much alcohol, also not true. Why, you, none of you should have Meniere's here. So too much caffeine, too much alcohol, too much salt, and too much stress, which basically describes my life. And so I've tried to control all those factors, and yet I have it. But I have come to a different conclusion about what caused my Meniere's. It is that for years, years, I listened to crappy pitches from entrepreneurs. <laughs> and these pitches were so lousy. They all started with 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs, 150 cans, million cans of dog food per day, 1% with my rock star co-founder, one and a half million cans of dog food per day. How hard could it be? And that's just America. There's dogs all over the world. <laughs> And so I listened to so much of this that I lost my hearing, I get dizzy, I have ringing in my head. So I came up with the 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint because I wanted to prevent just an outbreak of Meniere's in Silicon Valley and among venture capitalists. So 10 slides, 10 slides. The rule is 10 slides that you give in 20 minutes. You may ask, well, why 20 minutes when you have an hour? It's because, to my utter amazement, to this day, about 80% of the world uses Windows laptops. And I know that when somebody shows up, like this guy with a Windows laptop, it's going to take him 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> 30 points. Um, I, I did not see your presentations, but I hope you all used at least 30 points. A very good rule of thumb for a presentation is figure out who the oldest person is in the audience, divide his or her age by two. So if you're pitching to 60-year-old VCs, 30 points. 50-year-old VCs, 25 points. Someday you may be pitching an 18-year-old VC, nine points that day, okay? But until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 points. I'm gonna give you one more power tip. Make your background black. Black or at least deep dark blue. But black would be even better. The reason why you want a black background is because then people cannot tell where your slide ends and the background of the screen begins. You want it to be the least distraction. Have you ever gone to a movie and seen the credits where it's black text on a white background? Never, it's always white text on a black background because it's easier to read. So there's a lot of things that people intuit from a pitch. And one of them is if you use black text on a white background, it means that you are clueless with PowerPoint. You booted PowerPoint, you opened up a new document, you typed the text insert button and you, the text insert area and you started typing. 
If you use a black background, it shows that you are a ninja PowerPoint warrior, that you went to the master page and you selected a back background and you picked a white sans serif, bold face font that's easy to read. Black is the new black, okay? <laughs> use a black background. I'll tell you a funny story about this. So one day, I meet with this entrepreneur, it's about 11 in the morning, and he says, guy, I just pitched my company. I have three more hours before I have to pitch it again. So I have some free time. Do you have any tips for me on how I can make my presentation better? Now, this was an entrepreneur from uh, Georgia. He was a black entrepreneur. So I said to him, is your background black? And he said to me, well, yeah, I told you, I'm from Georgia. I'm from a multicultural family. I said, no, no, I can see. I can see that you're black. Is your background black? Okay, so just trust me, make your background black. Number seven. Number seven is the mistake that entrepreneurs believe that life as an entrepreneur should be serial, i.e. you do one thing, A leads to B, to C, to D, to E, to F, to G. So you raise money, you hire, you finish your prototype, you sell, you raise money, you hire, you revise your prototype, you sell. Okay, That would be life as a serial entrepreneur. Life is not serial for an entrepreneur. Life is parallel. So you have to raise money, finish your prototype, sell your prototype, support your prototype, and hire five or so things at once. You have to push all five tasks down the road at once. You cannot do one thing at a time. You have to do all of them at once. You should think of entrepreneurship not so much as a sprint, but as a marathon. And not only is it a marathon, this is a marathon that has 10 events. So it is a marathon meets a decathlon. That's what entrepreneurship is. It is not a 100 meter sprint. It is not even where you can pass the baton to the next person. You have to do 10 events for a long time, pushing all 10 down the road. Life is parallel for an entrepreneur. If you cannot deal with parallel existence where you're doing 10 things at once and all of them must be done well, you're gonna have a very hard time as an entrepreneur. Number eight. Number eight is the mathematical desire to quote, retain control. And you think that you retain control when it's you and your buddies, your co-founders own at least 51% of the company. And you believe that because mathematically you own the bulk of the company, you can control the company. That if it ever comes, push comes to shove in a board meeting, all your shares are gonna vote with you and you're going to have any decision you want. The reality is that as soon as you take outside money, you are working for the outside investor. The outside investor may have 20, 25, or 30%. You may have 70%, but from a fiduciary responsibility, from a realistic everyday life existence, you are working for the outside investor. It doesn't matter that they do not have majority position. You need to get that through your brain. If you can't get that through your brain, don't take outside money. You are working for, not to be sexist, you are working for the man as soon as you take outside money. The solution to this quandary of trying to own 51% is the realization that what is most important is not how much of the company you own, but how big the company is. That it is better to own 1% of a billion dollar company than 51% of a $20 million company. So it is all about making a bigger pie. As we say in Silicon Valley, the rising tide floats all boats. It is not how much of the equity that you own, 
It is how much the equity is worth. It is the, not the number of shares that's key, it is the per share price. Make a bigger pie. Number nine. Number nine is the assumption that filing patents is essential to the survival and success of a company. Now, if there are any attorneys in here, I'm not trying to diss your business. I'm trying to say that patents do not make a company defensible. Because if you file a patent, first of all, it takes a lot of money and between five and 10 years to actually get the patent. But let's say you file it, let's say you get it, and then let's say Microsoft, Apple, Google, Cisco, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, let's say somebody violates your patent. I mean, truly, truly does violate it. No, there's no discussion. Now you're going to litigate. And as an entrepreneur, you will not have the time or the resources to out-litigate a larger company. Venture capitalists are not in the business of filing patent lawsuits. They're in the business of funding companies who are creating customers, who create revenue. File your patent. It's an action you should take that someday may make you slightly more valuable. And if nothing else, it will impress your parents. <laughs> that your parents can say, my Johnny, my Susie, she has a patent to her name. That's worth something, okay? But don't believe for a second that a patent makes you defensible. What makes a company defensible is that you succeed. I think Chanel would agree that I would much rather have a company that is achieving market success with no patents than a company that has a bunch of patents and the dogs are not eating the food. <laughs> succeed. If you succeed and you have patents, then you can out-litigate other people. But it is always about succeeding. It's not about filing patents to make you defensible. And in your pitch, as you're talking to venture capitalists, venture capitalists are going to try to test your intelligence. And they're going to ask you, well, what makes your business defensible? And if your answer is, we filed a patent, you have flunked the IQ test. That question is a trap. The way you should answer that question is, well, of course, we file our patents, but we are not so stupid and naive to believe that the filing of patents makes us defensible. Instead, we are going to dedicate our lives to building a, a healthy business, and we're going to innovate as fast as we can because we believe that while patents are a nice thing to have, they are not the determinant of our success. Instead, we're going to work hard, we're going to create a great product, and we're going to die trying. That's the answer. When, you at, when you're asked what makes you defensible. Number 10. Number 10 is the desire to hire in your own image. Meaning that if you're male, you hire other males. If you're female, you hire other females. If you're in engineering, you hire other geeks and nerds. If you're an MBA, you hire other MBAs. And that is a mistake. That is a mistake. It leads you down these holes that you can't get out of. You need to hire people who compliment you. So when all is said and done in a startup, there are only two functions, OK? Somebody has to make it, and somebody has to sell it. That's it. Everything else is superfluous, making it and selling it. That's why when you look at Apple, there was Steve Jobs who could sell anything. And there was Steve Wozniak who could make anything. It's always about hiring people. If you are the best engineer, hire the best salesperson. If you're the best salesperson, hire the best engineer. If, you hire, if you're the best engineer and hire another engineer, there'll be nobody to sell what you make. If you're the best salesperson and you hire another salesperson, there will be nothing to sell. So you want to hire people who complement your skills, complement your perspectives, 
complement your expertise, not duplicate your expertise. If you're the CEO of a company, it should be a source of great pride that the people who work for you are better than you at their specialty. You should be ashamed if you're the best person and the smartest person in the room. It means that you have let your ego get in the way of the fiduciary responsibility you have to your company, your customers, your shareholders, and your employees. Number 11, as a bonus for you. The 11th mistake is that you want to be BFFs with your investors. So the way this works is you get an investment, and right after the check or the transfer clears, you're full of enthusiasm, and you're telling people, yeah, I love our potential investors. They really understand our business. And they told me that they invest in, and I hate to sort of diverge from what Chinoa said, but they told me that they invest in people. And so I know they're going to stick with me because they said they invest in people. And I'm the people they invested in. So it's not about the product or the market. It's the people. So we, we they invest in people. And so we're seeing eye to eye. We're completing each other's sentences. We're just best friends. We're going to go play golf at the Wildlife Country Club with our investors next week because they love us. They invest in people. Oh my God, man, when you hear yourself saying that, it's time for a little reality check, okay? So the way you should look at it, and I don't mean to be too negative about it, but you are a means to an end, okay? That's the way you should look at it. An investor wants to give you a dollar and get back $20. That's it. You, on the other hand, you should look at them as a means to an end too. You need a bunch of things to succeed as an entrepreneur. One thing is capital. They are a source of capital. They're not a source of friendship and emotional support and psychiatric help. They are a source of capital. Don't make the mistake of trying to be best friends with your investors. And the way you fix this is you exceed expectations that you sandbag your investors. That whenever you make a forecast, you make a forecast that you are 90% sure you can exceed. And if you do that, you don't have to worry about friendships. They will love you because you're probably the only company in their portfolio that's exceeding expectations. This is a much better way to build a relationship, is to exceed expectations than to think that you are best friends and you're seeing eye to eye and you're going to be together forever. Exceed their expectations. Now, I hope I have not disturbed you too much. But these are the mistakes that I most often see with entrepreneurs. I hope that you'll take this information and avoid these mistakes, or at least understand that you may be making these mistakes and to ameliorate the degree to which you make these mistakes. Ideally, you would make different mistakes that I have not mentioned that at least would be unusual. But I think that these are the most common mistakes. I've made many of these mistakes myself, and I hope you can take my information and what I just provided to you and never make these mistakes. Or I'd just be just as happy if you prove me wrong that you make these mistakes and you still succeed. But I think this will get you off to on a great start in this post-funding, post-pitch stage where you have to start delivering. Those are the top 10 mistakes, actually, top 11 mistakes of entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to take questions? Yeah, we got time for q Yeah, I have. My flight doesn't leave till Saturday, so. Um, <laughs> And, and there are no waves today. So, do you have any questions for me? Uh, 
Do you have mic runners or? Does it not matter? Just yell. Okay, just yell. You with the laptop from IBM. <laughs> um, what are some things of entrepreneurs that you've met that have impressed you the most? Um, the question is, what are the things of entrepreneurs that, that impress me the most? Uh, by far, traction. Traction. I don't necessarily, you know, I, I don't want to deal with somebody I despise, but if I had to, I'd rather deal with someone I despise who had traction than someone who's a really nice guy who doesn't have traction. So, uh, again, this is along the lines of Chanel that, you know, traction trumps everything. Sales trumps everything. I mean, in, in I don't, listen, I don't care if you have ADHD, OCD, or Asperger's, man. If you have sales, hallelujah. I'm, I'm not looking for friends here. I got plenty of friends. So it's traction. In my, you know, the, every investor's dream is that an entrepreneur shows up and says, oh my God, you know, my buddy and I, we, we created a product or service that we wanted to use with no market research, no proof, because that just describes Apple and Facebook and YouTube and eBay. So we have no proof, we have no proven team, but we started this on a whim. You know, we stole, we stole server space from BYUH where we're at school. The IT department still hasn't figured out that we're doing this. And we started this company and now, 5,000 people are signing up every day, so we put a little you know, thing at the bottom of our crappy little website. This is click here if you want to advertise here or buy stuff. And now, I mean, so many people are clicking on that button, we can't handle it, so we need, we need capital so we can hire more people so we can handle all the sales inquiries. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's the pitch I want to hear. That's the pitch I want to hear. Because this is called Guy's Golden Touch. So Guy's Golden Touch is not what I touch turns to gold. That is not true. I wish it was true. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold Guy touches. <laughs> so I want you, let me tell you, let me give you a little secret about evangelism. Lots of people, lots of people ask me secular evangelism. I realize where I am. So <laughs> lots of people, first there was Jesus and then there was Guy. There was a big gap between. So anyway, so, so. You know, lots of people ask me, well, what's the key to evangelism? I'll tell you what the key to evangelism is. A great product or service. Because it is so easy to evangelize Macintosh. It's so easy to evangelize Canva because it's so great. And it is so hard to evangelize crap. So the key is great stuff. What else? Yes. The one, What's the, one habit the one habit I wish I started earlier? Yeah. A little TMI here. Um, <laughs> well, I took up surfing at 62. That's roughly, you know, 58 years too late. So I wish I started surfing earlier. Um, huh. I don't want you to think that I like have my act all together, but there, there are some habits that I should take up that I haven't yet. So that, I guess by definition, that means it's too late, right? So, uh, you know, I'm writing a book, and I, I don't have the discipline to avoid email and social media. If I could turn off my OCD desire to answer every email, and to maintain all my social media, my book would have been done a year ago. So what happens to me is I wake up and I tell myself, you should write and then do everything else. And what do I do? So oh, let's just check email, see if anything important happened. And then let's check LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. And next thing you know, it's noon. <laughs> and so that's a habit that I have not yet accomplished. Um, the ability to correctly prioritize. So the only reason I have achieved any success is because I have been able to overcome my lack of discipline and prioritization by working longer and harder than most people. If I could prioritize my life better, I would have to work a lot less and a lot shorter. 
So that's my bad habits. Yes, in the Aloha shirt. The best way to what the company? Uh, evaluate. So it gives evaluation. Value. How do you value the company? Yeah. Well, when, you, when you're approaching your, a second round of funding, what mistakes do you see when evaluating what the company is worth? And what do you see as. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's all about traction, especially in the second round. My goodness. Uh, in the second round, if you don't have traction, I mean, you're you're pushing a ton of stuff uphill. I think it's all about traction. You could almost make the case it's about profitability or you should be near cash flow break even by the second round. You know, the good news about today's conditions is that for many kinds of companies, not necessarily biotech, but for many kinds of companies, everything you need now is either cheap or free. Right, so now you don't, you don't buy servers anymore. You don't pay for marketing, you use social media. Uh, you don't hire the most expensive people. You subcontract, you use you know, people in Ukraine or Croatia or Russia, I don't know about Russia, but you know, and, and so everything you have, the tools are open source. You use MySQL, I mean, so I'm going down the list and everything, everything that's necessary is free or cheap, which means that you can do a lot more with a lot less. So I think investors are rightfully expecting that when you show up, it's not simply an idea on PowerPoint. That when you show up, you should have something that is at least a demonstration. Even better, you're beginning to show traction. And in the second round, that is absolutely necessary. You have to show traction. What else? Yes. So uh, there are ways that go back to your after this. But, um, Where? Yeah. Go, go, to Island. go to Island? Go to Island, just right out here. Okay. Um, but my daughter brought her board. Oh man. <laughs> so the question is in my college and MBA experience, what, what are the things that I still use? Oh man. I may have to lie. Um, you should never take Q&A after a keynote speech. Because you lose control. Like I, I have to come up with an answer that's salient, palatable, and true. I can, I can pick two of those three and give you an answer. Uh, Are there any people you met in college? Well, well, I could say that the, the person who got me my job at Apple, who fundamentally changed the arc of my life, I met at Stanford. So. That may be the most valuable thing that came out of Stanford, honestly. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you that on any given day I use calculus. I can't tell you that I use statistics. I can't tell you that, well, I, I majored in psychology, so there is some, you know, I, I do use some psychology. Uh, if, you know, may I make a recommendation that all of you should take at least a course, I hope it's offered here, in behavioral economics? Because behavioral economics, I think, is the key to the future. Uh, you know, why do people do what they do? Why do people buy what they buy? Why do they do that kind of stuff? So maybe some psychology, but I mean, if you're looking for that answer that, yeah, you know, I learned this spe specific algorithm in college that I've applied to the rest of my life, it's just not true. And in the MBA program, wow. I. You know, when I, was, when I was getting an MBA, the way the world worked, for better or for worse, was that an MBA was necessary to get certain kinds of jobs. So MBA was proxy for intelligence. And today, I would say that the world has taken a different attitude and that 
It's much more of a flattened world. It's much more of a meritocracy. And I think that you could make the case that it's about skills as opposed to degrees. So in social media or in, you know, in, is it more important to have a degree in digital video production or to have a portfolio of great digital video? Hmm. I might make the case the skill is more important than degree. So I think it is a different world. Back when I was in school, you had to get an MBA to get a certain kind of job. I don't think that's true uh, today. Okay? Anything else? Have I shaken you up enough? Yes. What kind of student were you? What kind of student was I? Well, there's what I tell my kids, which I was <laughs> diligent, hardworking, never cheated, never lied, always on time. And there's the reality. Although I didn't cheat. But uh, I was, well, I was not valedictorian. I, I'm not a member of Mensa. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very funny story. Uh, I'm writing another book right now. And this is a compilation of the stories of my life that fundamentally affected my life. It's not an autobiography or a memoir. It is just stories of my life. I'll tell you some so you get an idea for this book. And so I told you that the teacher that affected me the most was my English high school teacher. And that was AP English. And just in going through all these old photos and albums, I found my ninth grade English report card. And, oh my God, the English teacher said, you know, something like, guy is making significant progress, but if it weren't for these two blown assignments, you know, he would be a good B plus student. That was quarter number one. Quarter number two is, guy has shown a disinterest and lack of discipline that is not befitting an honor student in an honor class. And it got worse from there. And so, I had this recollection of being this great English student, but apparently I wasn't. And so I showed that to my daughter, who I mean, I'm pounding on my daughter to get better grades. And I said, well, let's see, this is the truth of where your father was. So um, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell you, I'll tell you another. At Stanford, honestly, I looked for the easiest major I could find. And the easiest major you could find at Stanford in the 1970, 1980 time period was psych. So I majored in psych. That was the easiest major. Um, I can't end on that question. <laughs> you go, yeah. Oh, so. Uh, I'll repeat what he said, but I don't necessarily agree. So he kind of said, after achieving so much in so many areas, what makes you keep my f foot on the gas and continuing to work and all that? Well, in a rare moment of humility, let me tell you that I don't consider myself this like rock star success. You know, it's not like my name is Zuckerberg, Jobs, Gates, Balmer, Case, right? I haven't created these unicorn companies. I've been successful, but not to that degree. Uh, so, so with that caveat, um, what really keeps me going today, I, I have a mantra for myself, which is to empower people. So I want to empower people with my writing, my speaking, my investing, my advising. So that's, I want to make the world flat and a meritocracy where it doesn't matter where you're from, sex, gender, you know, all that kind of stuff, political or, you know, all of that. I wanted to make it a meritocracy. So that's what drives me. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what drives me? I have one son in college and two younger kids in private school. I have a lot of tuition to pay. <laughs> I mean, a lot. You'd be amazed how much tuition I pay. So every day I wake up saying, I got to pay tuition. That's what drives me. <laughs> all righty, thank you very much. Good luck to you all. Thank you, thank you.